Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Hey, thank you so much for joining us here on our YouTube channel for episode number 1057. Well, today we're going to talk about we're going to talk about being busy, but being organized and knowing when to say no. I'm going to be speaking with Anna Wabel. She's coming to us from Farmington Central High School in Farmington, Illinois. And she is busy. She's playing a lot of sports. She's showing cattle outside of the FFA. And she is full-blown inside the FFA as well. Lots of goals for her in the future. And, uh, you know, I understand where she's coming from. I definitely, when I was in school, when I was in college, I definitely performed better when my schedule did not have a lot of free time built into it. And uh, she thrives under those exact same circumstances. Very excited to bring this story to you, and we're going to get it started for you right now. Anna, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. I am excited to speak with you. And how is Illinois this morning, or I should say this afternoon? It's quite rainy at the moment. It's been uh, subtle downpours for the rest for the last 24 hours, so that's been very enjoyable. <laughs> well, I, is that good or is that bad? I know that uh, in the upper Midwest, we're looking for some rain right now. How about in Illinois? Do you guys have plenty or is this a blessing as you're going in the spring plant? We've been pretty dry, so it's been a blessing, but it's been kind of annoying for <laughs> sports and other things that have been going on. Okay. Are you an athlete? Yes. A uh, very avid one. I am never have a rest season. I'm go, go, go all the time. We're in track season right now, so that's really nice. Okay, so you're running track. What are your events? I throw the disc and shot put. Oh, well, awesome. Now, you can't say you're running field. It's track and field. So what do you tell people? Yeah. What I mean, what do you say? I just say, I usually just say I do field events. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not much of a runner. <laughs> me my, my mom always wanted me to run, but. Okay. So you're throwing the javelin and the disc. And, the shot and the disc. Oh, excuse me. The shot and the disc. Okay. So I was about to say something about that, but the shot put, throwing the shot put to me never, ever looks easy. I did that like in middle school and I was a baseball player and you can't throw a shot put like a baseball. So I was like, no, well, what is the you point? You will jack up your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> you it will hurt. You will. So that one never looks easy. But when it comes to the discus and the javelin, I think, I think you guys as athletes, you get short shrift because people look at that and they go, oh, yeah, I could do that. That's a Frisbee. Or, you know, it's just throwing it a spear. It is not a Frisbee. No, I know it's not. <laughs> I know it's not. The technique, that's one heavy Frisbee. <laughs> the technique that goes into that, I mean, that's pretty phenomenal. You have got to, to throw that thing. You tell me if I'm wrong. But to throw that thing with any distance and with any success, A, your footwork has to be phenomenal. Uh, your, yes. your lower body has got to be absolutely in great shape and strong to propel that thing. And then you've got to be able to use your upper body and your arms as like this slingshot almost, right? Yes. It's so difficult, especially in the beginning, like getting used to it. I've slowly been getting better at it. My throwing coach tells me that I don't use my legs as much as I need to, but mm -hmm. I take that as I will. And I, I'm <laughs> trying to get better at that. But. Okay. So you've got that sport going in the spring. What do you have going in the fall and in the winter? Well, I've been picking up golf recently. My, one of my best friends and I have been playing golf. So I do that in the fall season and I play basketball in the winter. Okay. So that's, that's probably my main sport. I love basketball. Okay. what did you think about, uh, about the uh, women's final four and the men's final four? Women's final four was crazy. I thought the men's final four was crazier. I knew Baylor was going to win, but I'm a big Illinois fan. Uh -huh. So them getting beat by, by a Loyola was crazy heartbreaking oh my goodness that broke a lot of people's heart especially people yes. that have brackets filled out right my bracket was killed <laughs> well see that's because you picked emotionally you can't pick emotionally. yeah i did <laughs> of course both illinois schools though right in True. that game yeah i am i do lean more towards the champagne urbana side, oh okay but. okay well you're right the that men's final four that ucla gonzaga game uh, i don't even, i still don't know what to say about that that was unbelievable me either Two last-minute shots. It's yeah, crazy. It, totally crazy. Now, you say you knew Baylor was going to win. I would have never, ever predicted that. I was caught completely off guard. How did you know that? When I saw Baylor play in the Elite Eight and Final Four and how much Gonzaga, not that they struggled against UCLA whatsoever, they were both good teams, 
But when I saw Baylor play, especially in those second, those two, those la- those last two games, it was a little bit easy. I thought when they got to the game, they were going to take a handily. It mm. just looks so e- much easier to. It looks so much more easy. It looks so much easier to them than it did for Gonzaga. They looked like they were struggling sometimes. Yeah, you know, it's too bad. It, it feels to me like Gonzaga peaked in like the Sweet Sixteen or the Elite Eight. Yes. And then all of a sudden, that peak, that run was was coming to an end. They barely got past UCLA, and yeah. it wasn't even close uh, with Baylor. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that was very interesting. Very interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, and then golf. So uh, you say you're picking up golf now. I've just got this sense about you. I've got the sense about you that you're one of these people that makes other people mad with your athletic ability. So you say you're. Uh, di- yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. So you're just picking up golf. So what does that mean? That you only shoot par three out of four times every every time you go out? What's that mean? Well, picking up is a loose term right now. I've only golfed a few times in my life, but I already told my friend that I'd play, I'd be on the golf team with her next year. And I told the coach, so that will be a new sport next year. So, okay. but I, I am very competitive, but the skill in golf hasn't exactly gotten there yet. Okay. So we'll we'll see how that turns out over the summer. Okay. So which part of your golf game needs the most work? All of it. Just <laughs> <laughs> it's it's pretty bad. I'm not very good at putting whatsoever, but I feel like that should be like the easiest part, but it's definitely not. No, that is not the easiest part. Although I think most people are going to be like you and think that's the easiest part, but no. Yeah. No, not at all. Yeah. Interesting. Well, good for you. So you're an athlete, and of course the FFA you've got going on. My daughter, she's a she's a freshman this year, and she's she's playing softball. And right now, they're they're having a lot of success on her FFA team for um, for conduct of meetings, and she's running into mm-hmm. all these conflicts between softball and FFA right now. How do you balance that stuff yourself? Well, I'm also involved in a lot outside of FFA and sports. I'm also I also show cattle, so I also mm-hmm. have to figure that out. And I'm very involved in my church. So I also have to balance that. And honestly, today has been one of the hardest days to balance it because since track starting, basketball just ended, we're doing livestock judging. I'm trying to get cattle ready. It's so like difficult to have like a calendar balanced out and to never expect those changes Mm -hmm. to the calendar. So right now I've been recently, I've been really trying hard to map out my day to day like schedule. But sometimes that does not work. And most of the times it doesn't work because everything changes all the time. Yeah. Especially with how crazy this year has been. So I definitely, especially in these last few weeks, I've been struggling to like balance it appropriately and not like overwhelm myself. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't been that bad. Like these last few days I've been, I'm good at telling people no, but also Mm -hmm. not good at not doing it like i'll tell people no and then i'll show up to the thing anyway (laughs) so (laughs) i like i like to be involved and that's it's hard because every i like to be involved in everything but sometimes that's impossible because there's also so much going on so i've been really trying to split my time after school we go to school from eight to two so i try to go to track practice till three do some fa stuff till 4 30 and then I go home and do my cattle chores and get that all done before I have to go to bed. So I, I try to split my time evenly, as evenly as I can, because that's what's fair to the coaches and sure. to the advisors and to all my other teammates. So, hmm. Man, that's crazy. You bring up such a good point, which is it's very, very important to be able to say no. And I know we're, we're laughing over the fact that you say no, but you show up anyway. But when <laughs> yeah. you say no... You do set that boundary, which is, no, I've got to focus on these other things. Now, if you get done yeah. sooner than you expected or if something opens up, when you show up, that's a bonus. But at least you're not letting anybody down because you've already yes. said no. They're not, they're not counting on you. And, it, and if you can make it to that, then, it, then it's just a bonus. And so, But that's a really hard thing for people to do, to say no. People yeah. want to please and they want to say yes all the time. And it's hard to excel at anything if you get pulled in those thousand different directions, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like recently, especially for me, I've been spread so thin doing all of, I'm in a harvest leadership team at our school also, mm-hmm. which is another big leadership team that, that we have to do projects for. So I feel like 
being put in all these leadership positions, it's also easy for me to bounce things off of each other. So I can be doing an FFA project, but then double that as my harvest team project. Mm -hmm. So I'm, so even with that thin spread of what's going on recently and what hasn't been happening and what has been happening, I have been able to bounce a few things off of each other to make it easier for me in the long run. Okay. Oh, very cool. Okay. Well, let's talk about, uh, man, I got, to you totally sidetracked me with sports. So, you know, in your busy schedule, you've also got this guy from Idaho that wants to talk to you and you're not even talking about FFA yet, really. We're just talking about sports, but let's talk about, let's talk about you for a second. So when you go home, you work with cattle. Do you, does that mean you live on a farm? Am I, am I deducing correctly? Yes, I do live on a farm. We run about 25 pairs of purebred Simmental cattle or um, low percent Simmental cattle. So I'm involved very heavily in the American Junior Simmental Association okay. and the Illinois Junior Simmental Association. So that's a fun experience and getting to meet all those people and do this. It's so it's so good at preparing me for what I want to do in the future. Oh, yeah. I'm really thankful for that. Yeah. Explain to us what you mean by low percentage Simmental. So... If I breed my purebred Simmental heifer to a purebred Angus heifer, uh -huh. you get a 50% Simmental. So that's like your low percent Okay. In that area. Okay. Or like you can do other crossbred things. Okay. So we're just talking crossbreds. And when you, when you are breeding crossbreds, are you selling them as commercial cattle? Or are you selling them as, like, is there a registered breed for a Simmental Angus cross? Yes, there is. It's, uh, it is called the low percent Simmental. Okay. Or Sim Angus. Okay. And that is, we, but like, if we're selling, if we're selling a uh, slaughter cattle or just like a cold pair that we didn't really, that didn't really fit in mm -hmm. our program, we will sell them as commercial because they sell better. Okay. And so for that low percentage Simmental, is it always have to be a cross with Angus or can you cross with another breed? No, you can cross it with anything as long as it's above 50% Simmental. So okay. it can be like 65%, anything. Anything between seven eighths in purebred is considered purebred, and anything from like six, anything from seven eighths and down is considered low percent Simmental to okay. fifty percent line. Okay, very interesting. Now I have noticed uh, interviewing students out of your region, particularly Illinois, I hear more people talk about Simmental than maybe anywhere else in the rest of the country. Is it? Is that is that a thing where you're at? Is is a lot of people raising Simmental? Is there a reason for that? There's a lot of people, um, especially in that Simmental Angus cross. That's like your most productive um, meat. That's your most productive meat animal. So I think that the Simmental influence has really created a good road back and forth, and mm -hmm. it brings so much variety to it. You can have even like speaking in cut like color patterns. Like you can have red or blaze face. Or you can have just like I show cattle, so it's very important that they we have good product, good good looking, good production, sound structured females, mm -hmm. so that we can have so we that so that we can have success in the show ring and success when they're cows. So it's a big deal, and they're they're probably in my opinion they're the best breed, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so I might get some backlash from that from some of my friends because they like Angus, but. Oh, you might get backlash from your podcast host. I mean, you're talking to a guy who raised pulled Herefords, so. Oh, uh, I'm not even talking about the Herefords. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now you're a sophomore. You're just wrapping up your sophomore year. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Five more weeks. <laughs> Five more. Oh, but who's counting? So. Nope. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> so how long have you been part of the FFA then? Well, I like to say since I was a little kid, my dad was an FFA teacher okay. way back in the day. And then when I was born, he worked for CART, which is like the curriculum people. Okay. So he really got me into the ag industry, and he's the whole reason why I do what I do today. And that's really important to what I've been doing and how I live my life. And he actually taught where I go to school when I was in fourth and fifth grade. Okay. So I was, so, I was super involved. Like I was down in the ag room every day okay. for two years. And then he got another job. So throughout my junior high experience, I didn't really, I wasn't really involved in the FFA until about eighth grade when they let the exploratory ag kids come up and have like 30 minutes every week just to like see how it is. And then my freshman year, I was, I was actually an FFA member, like a legit FFA member. Okay. So 
from the first from the starting day of that i've been involved ever since <laughs> it's been go 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 and i would not want it any other way okay now obviously the the influence of your dad uh played a lot into this but my daughter she's a year younger than you I've dragged her into my podcast studio. She's got zero interest in podcasting. So it's it can't be just your dad. There had to be more yeah. to this. What else about the FFA, I guess, appealed to you and made you know you wanted to be part of it? The culture is just so amazing. And so, like, I when I think of FFA, I think of more of a family aspect instead of, I'll, it's not a part of the FFA, but I always think a family should be in there somewhere because it's definitely a close knit group always. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what thing you're doing. You're always going to find somebody to talk to and you're always going to find somebody that you're going to relate to like on a, a level of, I love to show cattle. So does this person. And I love to do public speaking. And so does this person. And there's so many people that you can just find your common interests in. Mm -hmm. So that aspect of it is just so invaluable and i also like i said i'm very competitive and <laughs> the competition aspect is also really nice and getting to just continue to do what i love to do all the time is just amazing and i would not trade it awesome okay how many ffa advisors do you have there now we have two mr look and mary plumber awesome okay thank you so much for acknowledging them Let's finally uh, talk about your supervised agricultural experience. So explain to everybody what you've been doing. We know it involves beef cattle, but tell us kind of about the operation. So I do a beef production entrepreneurship, SAE, and um, it's pretty crazy all the time. You got to, I have in my record book, I have about 10 pairs of cattle I've had since I was about eight years old. Okay. So they've been going for a long, they've been producing for a long time and that's really nice and i pretty much in my record book i do um i do the show heifers i've had in the past and then put into my i do a book that has my show heifers and like my show animals and then i put and then i do a book that has after they've retired from their show career okay. to the the female and the production career so oh interesting okay so was eight years old the very first time that you ever showed cattle Yes, it was. I was a little tyke back then. I uh -huh. showed a, a big red heifer and it was, I was probably over my, <laughs> I was probably a little deep into it because that heifer was huge, but I was a little, I was just a little girl who just wanted to show cattle and it was, I've been in love with it ever since. Well, as long as you weren't the one that had the halter breaker, you were probably okay. Yes, that is very correct. <laughs> <laughs> I did not have to do that. I'm thankful for it to this day. Okay, so you you got started doing it. You loved it. And you said you you started with this these uh, ten heifers back when you were eight years old. Was this uh, some sort of like was this passed along through the family, a family gift? How did that happen? Well, I started with two heifers um, when I was eight, and then I slow graduated grad and I slow and I gradually got to ten heifers by now. Uh -huh. So and we've sold a few here and there. So back. Um, these two heifers, my dad bought for me to start, get started and get my herd going. Okay. And then throughout these years, I've been just over the years with when I get my own money, I can buy and sell and refigure that how I please. So that's been really nice. Okay. Very good. Okay. So you've got two different aspects. So I'm obviously the way you're describing it, uh, they are show animals for you when they're younger and then they are aging out of that, or you've got, you've got better stock coming up behind them. So they're getting replaced yep. in that show string, and then you're going into purely production. So I understand the showing aspect of it. Um, obviously, you're showing uh, outside of the FFA through the association. Are you showing at the fair uh, as an FFA member as well? Um, we, do a, we do a few like section fairs, but we don't have like a show through the FFA. Okay. It's more showing through 4-H or showing through the Simmental Association. That's so. interesting. So no showing in the blue jacket. No, they, we don't. And I am envious of the people who do because that is cool. <laughs> and so that's just something that's not just not available to you at your school or how does that how does that pan out? We don't we I have never really been in the situation to um, have it like through our state fair we have the 4-H show and I know mm -hmm. FFA members can do it but it's more towards like 
it's more geared towards the 4-H members. Okay. But I see, like, I have friends from Oklahoma, and I see them showing in their FFA jackets, and I'm like, why don't we get to do that? <laughs> okay. Huh. That's interesting. Very interesting. Okay. So um, you're showing all the time, and then once things transition out of the show ring, tell me about your breeding operation. So our breeding operation, like I said in the beginning, is primarily primarily purebred. So in that, it's it's mostly me, but my dad is also assisting me at times because it's hard to balance everything, like I said earlier mm-hmm. too. Um, so we will we do mostly AI or embryo transfer. So we'll flush some of my females and then put embryos in like in recips, also okay. in my herd, or we'll AI and try to just get better stock in general okay. but usually that works and but sometimes it doesn't and then we have a cleanup bowl that comes behind them mm-hmm. so that's the more production side of things and then on the other side of that just the day-to-day stuff it's just chores every day okay. and keeping everything in check healthy good animal management okay all that stuff are you uh have you learned to do the ai yourself i have not i want to okay but I think that is definitely something that's going to happen in these next two years before I graduate high school. I would definitely love to. My dad and I have been talking about that for a long time. So. Okay. And so are you going to seek certification in it over the next two years or learn how to be a practitioner and just start doing your own cattle? I'd, all, I'd love to learn how to do it, but I'd also love to be certified so like I can do it for other people who don't have the sure. opportunity to go to the class and get certified. So especially especially if I can get it done sooner than later, Mm -hmm. I'd like to get certified and learn how to do it for just for myself. Is that something, can you get that certification through the FFA or would you have to go outside of the FFA to do that? I think you, I have, I'd have to go outside of the FFA to do it, but I haven't not, I haven't really looked into it. it. Okay, man, really interesting. So uh, obviously you're enjoying the cattle business. Is this something that you see yourself continuing even after FFA, after uh, you know, doing these junior shows and things like that? Definitely. I always tell my dad, especially, I don't know what, I, I love every other thing that I'm involved in and I love FFA and I love everything else, but without the cattle industry, I don't really know. Like, I feel like I'd be so not busy <laughs> <laughs> and, and I need that busyness and that structure and I love it. So I don't know where I'd be without the cattle industry. So I definitely don't think it's something I can put on the back burner okay. ever. So I'm going to con- I'm definitely going to continue to do it. Even if I have to take a break when I go to college, I will definitely continue to do it past that and try to find a way that I can fit it into my lifestyle. Okay. Now you brought up college. So you obviously you've got that out there on the horizon. Do you have an idea what you want to study when you get there? And no pressure on that. I know it's early. I've always thought of ag engineering because I like numbers and I like that kind of thing. But something that's been coming up kind of recently is ag education because I really like my ag advisors and I really like what my dad has done. Mm -hmm. And my mom, pretty much everyone in my life has been an educator in some sort of fashion. So I feel like maybe that's, that's how I should go too. So definitely that's been on my mind a lot recently. Okay. Oh man, that's exciting. And either way you choose is super exciting. I would love to have you back in the classroom and teaching ag. But the flip side, uh, a young lady who likes math and engineering, who's this natural athlete and playing all these sports and doing all these extracurricular activities, I can't imagine the scholarship she would get in, in, yeah. in pursuing STEM like that. It's phenomenal to think about all those opportunities. So and whichever way you yeah. choose is super, super exciting. That is great. Well, I would love to do this. I kind of already asked you your advice about saying no and, and why that's important. So let, let me ask about something different. You keep, t- you keep bringing up this word because you're very, very busy. And it's such an interesting phenomenon because I've experienced, I think, what you're talking about. But you keep talking about needing that structure. And you stay busy because I, I, I suspect that you stay this busy because you perform better this busy because it keeps you focused and it makes you yes it makes you really focus in on one particular task and do it well while you have the opportunity to do it mm-hmm. just for other students out there t- talk about why being busy and and having to be so organized helps you to perform better when a lot of people would say maybe it would diminish your performance 
Well, I definitely think this year has been a teller of that specific thing exactly. Since ever since last March, when we couldn't do anything, Mm -hmm. we really couldn't do anything, I got to a point where it was like, wow, I have nothing to do. Like, no, there's no reason for me to be doing this. Mm -hmm. I love when I have a track meet on one night and maybe the next night I have a livestock judging contest because that gives me the opportunity that I can perform exactly and do exactly what I need to do in that moment and not take it for granted. Mm-hmm. Because there's no, we're not, I'm not going to be in high school forever and I'm not going to have the time in FFA forever. So I have to take advantage of every single opportunity I have in FFA and track and basketball and my harvest team and my leadership teams I'm on throughout my school and 4 H, whatever it may be. I'm, I turn 18 March 2nd in two years. So <laughs> when that, when that turns out, I am done with after that May, I'm done with FFA and that's going to, that's going to be a hard one to handle yeah. because all this stuff and all the contests and just the diversity you get inside of it, take it, take advantage of that situation because you never know. And you never know, you never know when it's going to take, get taken away because I, just because of the COVID pandemic and because of how not busy we were this time, mm-hmm. exactly a year ago, it has given me the structure this year has given me the structure and the time management skills and the way to balance everything. Because if you can't balance everything, you can't do everything. So that's a big thing. So just the structure and the opportunities that FFA gives you and the opportunities that everything else gives you, you just have to take it for, don't take it for granted, but take advantage of it and take it all in because you're never going to get high school back and you're never I have two more years, but I never, I'm never going to get my sophomore year back. So I love to take, I love to take advantage of the situation and do my best because number one, because I'm competitive, but number two, because I like to do well, but number three, because I love when other people do well. So especially I feel like sometimes my performance like boosts other people's morale. So that's a huge thing, like a leadership thing. Mm -hmm. So just in that, just take advantage of the situation. And don't let don't let poor time management get in the way of doing well in a situation that you can do really well in. Okay, that's great advice. And one last question I completely forgot to ask you. Uh, What position do you play in the basketball team? I am the center, the big, the guard. How tall are you? I'm five nine, but I'm also really strong. (laughs) So I. I'm down in the trenches most of the time. Wow. Cool. That is awesome. Anna, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being here, everybody. And thank you to Anna Wabel for coming on the Off Farm Income Podcast today and sharing that great story with us, that great information. And hey, we would love to have you click that subscribe button down there, everybody, and become a subscriber to our YouTube channel here. And we'd love to connect with you on social media as well. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And everybody, until next time, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.